So if I have a limitation uh, as far as being able to use my coalesce uh, option that I'm considering because of the uh, operating temperature of the oil, it leads us into the vacuum dehydrator. Uh, what are the advantages of a vacuum dehydrator and uh, what's your thoughts as far as where those can be used? Well, the theory of vacuum dehydration is to vaporize the water, turn it into water vapor, and then the flowing of the air under vacuum through the vacuum chamber removes those vapors out of the, out of the system. There, the lubricant falls to the bottom of the chamber, and and then it's it's pumped and filtered back back to the reservoir. Uh, water will vaporize or it boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 C at sea level, as a rule. But when you put when you put water under a vacuum, it will vaporize or boil at a much lower temperature. So all a vacuum dehydrator is doing is playing with with that physical property of water. So at a vacuum of around 25 inches of mercury, water will vaporize at approximately 133, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. At that temperature, we have not, we're not causing the lubricant to oxidize at any accelerated rate because most lubricants maintain oxidative stability up to 150 to 168 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat typically is needed to get the lubricant to that temperature before it's exposed to the vacuum. Now, you don't have to have heat for a vacuum dehydrator to remove water because one of the physical properties of air is that when air is compressed, water will fall out of that air. Because the humidity increases, we've got more water in a smaller area, water falls out. Just the opposite happens when, we, when you put water under a vacuum. You put, excuse me, not water under a vacuum, but air under a vacuum. When air is under a vacuum, the humidity of the air decreases. So the air flowing into the vacuum chamber has lower humidity than the lubricant has. Humidity is always going to try to equalize in an environment. And with that lower humidity air flowing through the vacuum chamber in contact with the, the wet lubricant, mass transfer is the term that, that some people use. But, but by mass transfer, you're going to be removing water even before you get to that heat. But if you want to remove the maximum amount of water that you can remove and not harm your fluid, understanding that water in that fluid is harming the fluid and it's harming the systems that it's, the fluid is trying to lubricate and protect, vaporizing that water and getting it out removes the water at a faster rate. And that's important, faster rate, because I think it's real important to mention that if you have to recover a system that has a water ingression, heaters are required. I would agree. Well, Absolutely. Let's, let's make a point about mass transfer that needs to be understood, too. Um, mass transfer has its place, and mass okay. transfer can be used effectively. But a vacuum dehydrator is a very expensive way to mass transfer. To get the effect that Richard was talking about, the low humidity, you can do two things. You can pull it under a vacuum, which spreads everything out, makes it less dense, or you can just have really dry air. So when you're looking at, okay, I, I just need a maintenance item, I'm not removing a lot of water, um, having a vacuum pump and, and all these mechanical components that are necessary for vacuum dehydration is not an efficient way to do mass transfer. There's another way to do mass transfer. Which right. kind of yep. Ma mass list. transfer in a vacuum dehydrator, as you said, is expensive. It removes maybe cups of water a day. Vacuum dehydration, where you're literally flashing the water off as a vapor because we have heat, we can remove gallons of water per hour. So if you've got a large system and a large amount of water, heat is really needed to get ahead of the water ingression, to actually get the water content somewhere well below saturation. Uh, mass transfer will remove some water, but it's, it's going to remove a very small amount of water over a long period of time. Mm -hmm.